Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Fatal Feuds 5 Medieval Downfall. Over the past four installments in the Fatal Feud series, we have followed the rise of the de Burgh family under Richard de Burgh, the Red Earl of Ulster, and his first cousin, William Leah de Burgh. At the end of the last podcast in the series, we saw the family face an uncertain future in 1326 when the Red Earl died. This episode follows the next generation of the de Burgh family, and as the title suggests, things don't go according to plan, in what is a dramatic conclusion to the series. Before I released this podcast, I asked a couple of listeners to preview a draft of the show. While they all gave positive reviews of the show, some highlighted that there are a few characters who have similar names, which can complicate things. So to help clarify things, I have posted the de Burgh family tree in the show notes at my website irishhistorypodcast.ie. That explains all the major figures mentioned in this episode and how they relate to each other. As I said, this is available in the show notes linked at the front page of my website irishhistorypodcast.ie. If you're having any trouble finding the page, the specific address for those notes is irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash fatal. And before we begin, I just want to thank Irene, Ryan and Reg for the feedback. Now, let's get into the show. By the 1320s, Ireland was a land where the population lived on their nerves. Violence was common and an ill-judged move or decision could prove fatal. Simple sights and sounds that scented an imminent attack could make your blood run cold. The lives of those who inhabited the Norman settlements along the frontiers of the Wicklow Mountains, a stronghold of the Gaelic Irish, were a testament to this. In the dead of night, the scream of the Gaelic Irish words, Fenacabu, could unnerve even the most hardened frontier colonist. These words, the battle cry of the Gaelic Irish or two of family, time and again signalled the start of a raid that saw houses burned, people murdered and lives torn apart. While the screams of a war cry echoing through a dark night might be a terrifying vista for many, in the west of Ireland a cloth banner had the same impact on Gaelic Irish communities. A simple red cross painted on a yellow background was the battle standard of the de Burgh family and it provoked fear and terror in many. When riders approached Gaelic homesteads with this banner flying aloft, it often meant trouble. For nearly 40 years between the 1280s and the 1320s, the Lord of Connacht and Red Earl of Ulster, Richard de Burgh, and more frequently his cousin, William Leah de Burgh, had attacked Gaelic communities in the West, forcing them to bow down and submit to the de Burgh family. These two men, the Red Earl and his cousin, had made their family banner a terrifying weapon in itself. The presence of the red cross on a yellow background and the soldiers who carried them struck terror into enemies, no matter where they went. While war cries and military banners built up powerful medieval families, fearsome reputations, it was the six words of the de Burgh family motto that put them into a league of their own in late medieval Ireland. This motto, one king, one faith, one law, summarised not only the de Burgh's loyalty to the king in England, but also their own internal unity and unbending loyalty to their own family patriarch, the Red Earl. Other families were often riven with internal disputes, but the de Burghs had always acted in unison. The Red Earl, for his part, had rewarded this loyalty by bestowing great power on his own relations. This unity, bound by the family motto, one king, one faith, one law, worked well. Between 1281 and 1315, the de Burghs rose to become one of the most powerful families in Ireland, even though, as we saw in the last episode, their fortunes declined after 1315 and the Scots invasion of that year. By the time the Red Earl died in 1326, the next generation of the de Burghs were still positioned to recover their former power. But that said, they were living in dangerous times. While unity and loyalty to the family patriarch had been key to the family's success, the younger generation of the de Burghs, 
faced a somewhat difficult situation in 1326 with the passing of the Red Earl. The family heir was a 14-year-old boy, William, a grandson of the Red Earl, under normal conditions an heir only inherited when he turned 21, but given that the de Burghs had powerful connections at court, this law was waived by the king and in early 1327, at the age of 15, this boy William was granted his grandfather's vast estates. He was also given a pseudonym like the old earl. His grandfather was known as the Red Earl and this boy William would be known as the Brown Earl. The power invested in this child was remarkable. If you just take a minute to think about his life from 1327 onwards, he was only 15 years old but was now one of the most powerful individuals not only in Ireland but also England. To invest so much power in any one individual, let alone a child, was risky. If this boy, the Brown Earl, wanted to emulate his grandfather's success, he would have to be able to command the respect of his vassals and relations in Ireland. Now many of these people were grizzled veterans of the Bruce invasion and were a people he scarcely knew given he had been raised in England so he unquestionably had a tough task ahead of him. Initially it was decided that the boy would not come to Ireland and he remained in England. From a distance it may have seemed that the situation in Ireland was stable if somewhat difficult. The country was unquestionably still reading from the devastation of the Bruce invasion a decade earlier but a layer of powerful leaders were emerging to whom the young brown earl could ostensibly entrust the family lands until he eventually came to Ireland. In the west, his grandfather, the Red Earl, had been dependent on his cousin, William Leah de Berg, and in the late 1320s, the Brown Earl made this man's son, Walter de Berg, the guardian of his lands in the west, surely a sensible approach. In the family's vast domains in Ulster, he found another man of a similar calibre. The de Mandeville family had for generations supported the de Burghs. Two generations of the family had already died fighting for them and in the late 1320s Henry de Mandeville was entrusted to look after the family lands until the Brown Earl arrived in Ireland. From the outside at least, this seemed to be the first steps in forging a new structure from which the de Burghs could recapture their former power. Indeed this structure was deepened with a crucial marriage alliance when Giel de Burgh the sister of Walter de Burgh, married into the de Mandeville family in Ulster. All that was needed, it seemed, was the arrival of the Brown Earl himself and, in accordance with their motto, a new unity could be formed. However, the boy remained in England and soon cracks began to emerge in this rosy picture. Not long after the death of the Red Earl, the weak King of England, Edward II, was deposed in a coup led by his wife Isabella and her lover, the Lord of Trim, Roger Mortimer, in December 1326. The king was imprisoned in Berkeley Castle and never seen again, most likely being brutally killed under Mortimer's orders late in 1327. This coup caused huge instability not only in England but also Ireland. Lords once reined in by the fear of royal retribution now acted with impunity. This saw long-running tensions between the Fitzthomas and Lapuera family explode into a major war across the southwest. As most major families were drawn in, the influence of the royal officials in Ireland fell to an all-time low. The knock-on effect of this in Ulster was catastrophic. While the region was administered by the capable Henry de Mandeville, Ulster was in poor shape. Nowhere had been more affected by the devastating war following the Scots invasion of 1315 and as the coup sucked power from royal authorities across England and Ireland what seemed like a ghost from the past returned to haunt the Ulster lands of the Brown Earl. At Easter 1327 Robert the Bruce, the ageing King of Scotland who had been responsible for that devastating invasion of Ireland in 1315 now turned his gaze on Ulster again. He knew that the weakened authorities in England could not respond, while the royal representatives in Dublin would not be able to lend much aid either. He was correct and the colonists were filled with horror, dread and probably a certain degree of helplessness when the Scots landed in Ulster demanding the Anglo-Normans of the region submit to them. 
it now fell to Henry de Mandeville to react. Unlike his ancestors, who had also faced the Scots in 1315, he and the Norman colonists in Ulster were alone and isolated. Their lord, the 15-year-old Brown Earl, living in England, was of little use, while the royal authorities in Dublin struggled to even maintain law and order around the city, let alone send aid north. With no hope, de Mandeville opened negotiations with Robert de Bruce. This resulted in an extremely harsh and humiliating agreement imposed on de Mandeville and the Normans of Ulster. Robert de Bruce, the man responsible for invading and devastating the region in 1315, only agreed not to attack the colonists on the condition they send shipments of grain to Scotland. This agreement proved to be a pivotal and enduring moment when news and worse rumours of this agreement leaked out of Ulster and drifted across the sea to the young Brown Earl in England. After de Mandeville signed the agreement with Bruce, supporters of the 15-year-old Brown Earl sent a copy to the boy with a letter explaining the situation in Ulster. The contents of this letter were provocative in the extreme. It accused de Mandeville of acting disloyally in signing the agreement with Robert de Bruce. Now this was a really harsh interpretation of events in Ulster when in all likelihood de Mandeville had no choice given the hopeless situation he faced. In a worrying tone, the letter also stated that if the young Brown Earl did not arrive in Ireland soon, his vassals could well look for another lord to defend them, and his earldom was in danger of collapse. Certainly this point may have had some validity, given the harsh realities of life in Ulster at the time. This letter prompted action, and preparations were made for the boy to finally come to Ireland. While this was long desired, the speculation surrounding the agreement de Mandeville had made with Bruce had laid the worst possible foundations for relations between the Brown Earl and his new vassals. Seeds of distrust had been sown, and this did not bode well given unity and loyalty had been key to de Burgh's success in the past. The long-awaited arrival of the Brown Earl finally took place when he landed in Ulster in May 1328. Now you can only imagine what the initial meetings between the likes of Henry de Mandeville and the young Earl must have been like. Many of the Ulster colonists were battle-hardened men who had fought countless wars against the Scots and the Gaelic Irish. They now faced a callow youth, a 15-year-old boy who had lived most of his life in England, had little understanding of Ireland, but was now supposed to lead them. Clearly, the Brown Earl would have to win their respect, but his initial actions weren't promising. Late in 1328, the young Earl made his way to the west of Ireland, to his lands in the Lordship of Connacht, where a major conflict was breaking out between his cousin, Walter de Burgh, and the powerful Gaelic Irish O'Connor family. Walter had been guardian of his lands while he had stayed in England, and the Brown Earl needed to cultivate a strong relationship with the man. However, the young Earl made terrible decisions in this regard. His grandfather had allowed Walter's father control the West to the extent that one historian had called him the Lord of Connacht in all but name. Undoubtedly now, Walter, who had similar aspirations and ambitions, it didn't bode well then when, from the outset, that the Brown Earl tried to curb these ambitions. While Walter was still fighting the O'Connors, the young Brown Earl took the Gaelic king of the O'Connor family, Turlock O'Connor, into his service. This was a provocative and dangerous move which led to tensions with his cousin Walter. By 1330 these tensions were on the verge of violence. Walter had continued his war against the O'Connors to the extent that rumours abounded that he was trying to claim the kingship of Connacht for himself. Now these are probably completely untrue and it's more likely that Walter was just following his father's policy of dominating the West with an iron fist, one that had worked so well for the de Burgh family in the past. However, the young Brown Earl, lacking experience of Ireland and perhaps his own family's history, only saw this as a threat and became increasingly hostile. In 1330, he went as far as to offer Turlock O'Connor protection from Walter de Burgh's attacks. This was an indirect attack on his own cousin. Now Walter de Burgh reacted to this in a typical medieval fashion. 
that being violence. While attacking the Brown Earl was beyond him at this point, he planned a murder that would send out a clear signal. After a meeting between the Brown Earl and Turlock O'Connor, Walter sent a force of men to assassinate the Gaelic King. This murder sent out a clear message to the Brown Earl. He may have been the Lord of Connacht, but he couldn't ride roughshod over his own relatives. In the aftermath, there was no immediate response from the Brown Earl, who it should be remembered at this point was only 17. Now, while we might interpret his actions in Connacht as those made by a teenager trying to fill an adult's shoes, his future actions began to hint that there was more to it than this, and that the young Brown Earl had a tyrannical approach to ruling his land and his family. But before we go into this, I want to take a quick break. After his arrival in Ireland, the Brown Earl had gotten off to what you might call a pretty shaky start in Ireland. Certainly, his relations with his own cousin Walter could scarcely have been worse by 1330. However, rather than roll back and adopt a more conciliatory tone, in 1331 he began to pursue a very dangerous policy when he became openly aggressive towards his vassals in Ulster. There, his chief supporter was Henry de Mandeville, a man who, as we have seen, hailed from a family who had been loyal to the de Burghs for decades. However, the Brown Earl had gotten off to a terrible start with de Mandeville after he received the letter back in 1327 which claimed the Ulsterman had been disloyal. Then, in 1331, for reasons that remain unclear, the Brown Earl accused de Mandeville of, and I quote, homicides, robberies and other crimes and damages in Ulster. The exact origins of these claims are obscure, but it's almost certain the Earl was acting from suspicion and possible jealousy of de Mandeville. However, this move of accusing de Mandeville was disastrous. The talismanic figure fled Ulster, but was arrested by royal authorities north of Dublin and imprisoned in Dublin Castle. This undoubtedly created tensions now in Ulster. Henry de Mandeville and his family were Norman Ulster. They had been there long before the de Burghs had ever been appointed earls in the 1260s. Attacking such a man was dangerous to say the least, but the 19-year-old earl seemed oblivious to the risks, and if anything, he was emboldened by it. During that year of 1331, while he was turning on de Mandeville, his cousin in Connacht had continued to war against the Gaelic Irish of the province, which was a policy that the earl was now clearly opposed to. In November 1331, only a few months after his controversial attack on de Mandeville, the Brown Earl moved against his cousin when he had Walter and his brothers seized in Connacht. They were initially taken to Carrickfergus Castle, but in February 1332, they were moved to the more remote Northburg Castle. This fortress, only recently rebuilt after it had been destroyed in the Bruce invasion, placed Walter beyond any rescue. Situated close to Loch Foyle, it was one of the most remote Norman outposts in Ireland, but the events that took place there proved to be a point of no return. Early in 1332, Walter de Burgh, under the Brown Earl's instructions, was starved to death. Not only had the Earl killed his own cousin, but he had done so in a terrible and brutal fashion. This move had huge consequences. It destroyed any hope the young Earl had of unifying the de Burgh family under his rule. Their motto, revolving around unity, was as good as dead. It was clear in the aftermath of Walter's murder, the Earl would face staunch resistance from his own relatives now. While Ireland reeled from these events in 1332, many in Ulster and Connacht were bitter and very nervous now about the young Earl. Perhaps none more so than Giel de Burgh. As I mentioned earlier, Giel was the sister of Walter de Burgh, but had also married the brother of Henry de Mandeville. The Brown Earl now had not only murdered her brother by starving him to death, but had also imprisoned her brother-in-law Henry. Now Giel de Burgh was not a woman to take this lying down, and her actions had huge consequences in terms of medieval Irish history. Perhaps no other single individual influenced the course of history in the coming decades more 
than Guy of the Bird. By 1333, Guy de and her husband, Richard de Mandeville, had suffered enormously at the hands of her young cousin, the Brown Earl. Her own brother Walter had been starved to death, while her husband's brother, Henry de Mandeville, languished in a prison cell in Dublin Castle, with his fate yet to be decided. She, along with other Ulster colonists, also undoubtedly feared for her own safety, uncertain of what this young Earl might do next. Where still, having already established himself as a tyrant, the future was bleak. Indeed, the rest of their lives was bleak. In 1333, the Brown Earl was only 20. He could easily live another four decades. However, in his actions, he had confronted a hardened generation in Ireland. People like Gil de Berg, her husband and their contemporaries had lived through war, famine and unbelievable hardships, a life their ancestors couldn't have imagined. This had changed them as a people, and in early 1333, Giel began to think and plan out what once would have been considered unthinkable, to kill her own cousin, the Brown Earl. This was a move that was unprecedented. William was among the most powerful men in Northern Europe. Aside from his vast possessions in Ulster and Connacht, he held large tracts of land in England. Nevertheless, these concerns were all far removed from the world of Ulster in 1333, where a battle-hardened generation were being humiliated by what they must have considered a mere boy. By June 1333, a plan had been hatched, and as the 20-year-old Earl travelled to Carrickfergus, his own vassals turned on him, and in a location near modern Belfast, he was cut down. Who actually administered the fatal blow is unclear, but all sources agree the assassination was planned by Giel de Berg and carried out by her in-laws, the de Mandevilles, This assassination of such an important individual sent shockwaves through Ireland. While we don't know what Giel de Berg hoped would come from the murder, the people of Ulster paid a huge price. When the Earl was killed in June, the Justiciar John Darcy was raising an army in Dublin to travel to Scotland, where war had broken out again. This army, however, was diverted to Ulster, where it arrived in July the 1st, and John Darcy mercilessly hounded those responsible for the Brown Earl's death, with many being, according to contemporary sources, hanged, slain or torn asunder. Gildeberg managed to survive after she, along with her husband, fled beyond Darcy's reach, taking refuge among the Gaelic Irish O'Neill family. While this retribution had major consequences in Ulster, the impact of the assassination within the de Berg family and wider Ireland was incalculable and would echo through generations for centuries. Only a few years earlier, the Red Earl had ruled nearly half of Ireland by working with his first cousin, William Leah. After the murder of the Brown Earl, however, not only was there no hope of unity in the de Berg family, but the family had no heir to speak of. The Brown Earl had had one child, a daughter, Elizabeth, who was only one year old in 1333. This created mayhem. In the west of Ireland, in the Lordship of Connacht, the Red Earl's last surviving son went to war against William Leah's 20-year-old son, Edmund. You may remember this 20-year-old, who had literally known war since he was an infant. Known as Edmund the Scot, he had been the baby sent to captivity in Scotland in 1316 to secure the freedom of his father, an event I covered in the previous instalment of this series. This feud, though, engendered a terrible hatred within the de Berg family and only came to an end when Edmund the Scot captured the Red Earl's son. In an action that symbolised the darkness of the feud, Edmund the Scot personally drowned his own cousin in Loch Mask in 1338. However, the de Berg power in the West was long shattered. Shortly after Edmund the Scot emerged victorious, he was driven from Scotland by the Gaelic Irish O'Connor family, something that would have previously been unimaginable. The long-term impact of the implosion of the de Berg family left Connacht splintered, with numerous independent factions of that family frequently at war with each other. Edmund the Scot did return to lead what were known as the MacWilliam de Burghs. Other factions included the Clan Rickard de Burghs and the Clan William de Burghs, none of whom dominated Connacht 
like their common ancestors once had. Instead, over time, they were increasingly assimilated into the Gaelic world of the West, falling out of contact with the royal authorities in Dublin. In Ulster, after the murder of the Brown Earl, the colony was devoid of leadership of any kind. Not only was there no senior member of the de Burgh family in the region, but also the de Mandevilles were on the run as outlaws, along with some other senior colonists who had been involved in the assassination of the Brown Earl. Within months, the Gaelic Irish started to attack the colony. The situation grew so desperate that the royal authorities released Henry de Mandeville from Dublin Castle in 1334 in the hope that he could stop the attacks. However, the situation was beyond saving. Much of the colony in Ulster was in a state of perpetual crisis. Henry de Mandeville died in 1337 and by the following year the colony in Ulster was collapsing. Rather than lose total control, the royal authorities decided to lease huge tracts of land to a faction of the O'Neill family known as the Clan de Boy O'Neills. Once allies of the Normans, they soon took full control of this land that was ostensibly leased to them by the Crown and large parts of what had once been the Norman colony of Ulster was back under control of Gaelic Irish families. The murder of the Brown Earl had been a blow that shattered the family and changed the map of Norman Ireland considerably. By the year 1400, what had been the earldom of Ulster had collapsed into a sliver of land along the coast, while the lordship of Connacht had more or less disintegrated. While it was a stark collapse, in many ways it had been somewhat predictable. That both the Red Earl and his cousin William Leah were remarkable individuals is undeniable. Their ability to work together was unparalleled in medieval Irish history. Hoping that the next generation of their families, who were only second cousins and had never known each other, could form a similar bond was probably wishful thinking. However, it should also be recognised that while they made poor decisions and the Brown Earl was certainly unsuited to the great power invested in him, his generation were dealt a very poor set of cards. Ireland was reeling from the Bruce invasion, an event that undoubtedly created huge tensions and pressures in society. Whatever the root cause, 1333 was certainly a pivotal moment. Never again would Ireland witness a family as powerful as the de Burghs or an individual as influential as the Red Earl of Ulster, nor would there indeed be an assassination with such profound consequences as that of the Brown Earl. That brings the fatal feud story to a close. Next week, I'm thinking of looking at the Mam Trasna murders, a brutal killing that rocked Ireland in 1882. If you enjoyed this series, the story of Ireland after the assassination of the Brown Earl is continued in my book 1348, A Medieval Apocalypse, The Black Death in Ireland. This is a great way to get more Irish history podcast material and support the show. You can get the book in audio format, hardback or ebook at my website irishhistorypodcast.ie. That address, one last time, is irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, slán. So